All right, everyone, welcome to lesson 12, the final lesson of the course. And so in this lesson, we're going to go over permaculture, transition towns, and regenerative agriculture. This presentation will be on permaculture and regenerative agriculture. So I want you to think about this overarching question, which sort of looms over all of the content this week. Um, and this is really what permaculture and especially transition towns seek to establish. And that is, how can we establish human settlements that will be able to last for the indefinite future? Okay, so how do we do that? So all the stuff we've been talking about throughout the semester, permaculture and transition towns in particular, really sort of tie it all together. Everything from water to energy to social and environmental justice to building design to food production and so forth. Okay, so these are very holistic ways to think about designing human settlements. And so for the first part, with the permaculture and regenerative agriculture, we'll start, we'll sort of answer these questions. What does permaculture stand for? Uh, what does the term mean and why is it important? How can permaculture be applied locally? Um, what are the permaculture principles? So we'll see there's 12 permaculture principles. How can you apply those principles in your own life? Um, and then what is regenerative agriculture and what are the benefits? So first we start with permaculture. Um, and so we will get into detail about permaculture. This is, uh, there's not one universal symbol for permaculture, but this is pretty common to see something like this that shows you the, um, it's uh, supposed to represent the uh, 12 uh, permaculture principles. And it's circular, right? So circular resource use, it's not linear and so forth. Okay, so first I want to show you a quick video here. This one works. What is permaculture? In Australia, there's a man named Bill Mollison who got so pissed off at environmental destruction that he developed a way to design sustainable systems in every inhabited region on Earth. Mollison was concerned that conventional agriculture erodes soils, relies heavily on external fertilizers and biocides, and is a major contributor to global warming. Permaculture mimics ecosystems, reducing the need for inputs, and it avoids synthetic fertilizers and biocides. And permaculture is used for more than just agriculture. For instance, it's also used to design sustainable buildings. Today, millions of people around the world use permaculture to grow food, repair damaged land, build efficient houses, and create a sustainable future. So, that's a good introduction to uh, just a broad overview of what permaculture is. You see that it does involve di different aspects that we've been talking about like sustainable buildings, sustainable food production, sustainable water use, and so forth. Um, also we'll get into a little more detail about the history of permaculture here in a minute. So that's kind of gives you a nice overview of what it is. Um, and here's um, another video uh, that I think does a really good job of demonstrating some of the deeper philosophies and more specific applications of permaculture. And I actually want you to stop and let me geez, ads. Okay. Think about this quote. Um, so if if your food comes from the grocery store and, the, and your water from a tap, you will defend to the death the systems that bring these to you because your life depends on it. But if your food comes from a land base and your water comes from a river, you will defend to the death these systems. So I want you to think about that, what that means. It's, you know, it's all about a shift in perspective. And if we are totally disconnected from where our food is actually coming from, we all know that food grows in the ground. Now, of course, they have, you know, warehouse farms and so forth now, but most of the food comes from the ground. But if you're disconnected from that, it's really easy to ignore the the uh, the fact that we need to conserve soil and we need to conserve you know make sure the farms are regenerative and sustainable 
Um, whereas if you think, well, it's just from the grocery store, what are you going to, you're going to be more focused on making sure you can afford food from the grocery store, making sure the grocery store has food supplies, not necessarily that the land itself is um, sustained. And same with water. So um, perspective is really important. If you happen to pick up a newspaper these days, you'll probably find a growing sense of despair regarding climate change and environmental degradation. But there's been an astounding effort from countless communities to cull the rising tide of environmentally irresponsible actions. And among the surge of modern nature-related groups and philosophies lies the promising ideas of permaculture, which when unpacked provides us with a solid toolkit for not only tackling the difficult environmental challenges ahead, but also for thriving in a transformed world. Permaculture, a term coined by Australians Bill Mollison and David Holmgren in their 1978 book Permaculture One, was originally a contraction of permanent and agriculture, but has since blossomed into a more inclusive combination of permanent and culture. As Mollison readily admits, permaculture is nebulous. It's a little difficult to define what the permaculture community is. But those two words, permanent and culture, hit at the philosophy behind permaculture in the sense that it gives people a set of tools to rethink and redesign their communities so that they can live seamlessly with the natural world. And by working with, rather than against, nature in order to grow food, for example, permaculture bolsters not only the health of the land, but also its practitioners. In doing so, the concepts and practices of permaculture build communities that are adaptable to a changing climate. Jono Niger sums up these ideas in his book Permaculture Promise, wherein he writes, Permaculture is about rebuilding much-needed relationships with people, land, and the systems that support us. Through these relationships and a positive approach to change, permaculture seeks to build resilient cultures and communities. At the core of permaculture teaching lies three ethics. Earth care, people care, and fair share. While earth care and people care at their simplest forms are the concerted efforts to nurture natural environments and surrounding communities in your everyday actions, fair share is a bit less self-explanatory. The concept of fair share is essentially the synthesis of earth and people care and acknowledges that there is one earth that we all need to live on. So surplus, whether that's food, money, or time, should be shared with those who are otherwise languishing or be returned back to the earth. These three ethics ultimately intertwine to create an effective moral base on which permaculture practitioners can build and transform their local systems. They are essentially guideposts for tangible change. In practice, permaculture can take a variety of shapes. For instance, Jordan Osmond over at Happen Films toured Purple Pear Farm, an excellent example of permaculture at work wherein each natural system feeds off each other, thus creating both abundant food for the farmer and a healthier ecosystem. But permaculture can also mean projects like City Repair in Portland, which applies permaculture principles to artistic and ecologically minded projects that help reinvigorate local community relationships and the natural world. Now more than ever, permaculture is important because it brings to the table tangible and ethically based solutions for systemic change. It moves beyond sustainability and into resilience, looking towards not only surviving, but thriving in a quickly changing natural world. Starting at a local and personal level, the concepts of permaculture work to wean people off an industrialized and consumption-centric worldview, and replace that materialistic perspective with a new outlook that emphasizes ethical interactions with nature and a community-oriented lifestyle. Ultimately, this new worldview brings us closer to appreciating the source of our sustenance and our desire for interpersonal connection. And if we can rekindle this understanding that we need thriving natural systems to live, as Derek Jensen said so perfectly at the beginning of this video, we will then defend those natural systems to the death. So I don't know if you could see me, but I'm sitting there nodding my head the whole time. I mean, I just, I think permaculture is, um, it's just so, it just makes so much sense. Um, it's so holistic. It's so flexible. It's, uh, you apply it in whatever local context you have. And it's not dictatorial in that it doesn't tell you what to do. It just gives you these, these principles and these guideposts that you can use and apply it to, 
I mean, literally anything you can apply these principles to. We'll talk about some of that. But that's, I mean, I just absolutely love um, permaculture and what it means. And, and some of the things that I think is important to, to think about is he said beyond sustainability into resilience, which is really important. Not just sustaining something, but making it so that, you know, as climate change and anything else happens, um, that our communities are able to um, sort of rebound from that. And that's something we talked about earlier with resiliency. I also think <clears throat> it's important, and this is really common in the permaculture world, to they use the word thrive a lot. So thrive instead of just survive. So we not only do we want to just like make sure we don't collapse, but we want to make sure we have these really robust, high quality of life communities where everyone um, you know sort of has what they need to, to thrive. Um, away from this industrial centric world, so sort of more like a localized solution, like we think about industrial farming that we talked about before, get away from that, you know, sort of one size fits all, huge monoculture type of model to more localized um, uh, resources. A, fo a focus away from consumption, so again, this is uh, addressing materialism. Permaculture is very non materialistic um, and really anti consumption. It's really about promoting self sufficiency. Um, and harmony with nature and focusing on human and natural communities. So again, it's very holistic. It's not just about people. It's not just about the environment. It's about, um, you know, sort of everything, every living thing. Right. And that's just that quote from, from Derek Jensen that I wanted to, um, reiterate. So that's a pretty good, oops, let me stop that. If you'd like to learn how to put permaculture to work. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So, so permaculture, <clears throat> as you saw in that previous video, and you want to jot this down. It's it's it used to be it started as a, um, a sort of a concatenation of uh, permanent agriculture. And now it's permanent culture. Okay, so it's a sustainable design system uh, stressing the harmonious interrelationship of human, plants, animals, and the earth. So there's no one definition of um, permaculture. That's a, a pretty good one. Um, and it's also really important to understand that permaculture is a set of principles and practices. So it's not like here's what to do it's like here's some things you can use to live more sustainably live more resiliently um to establish a more harmonious relationship between human settlements and the natural environment right so it's like here's some tools you can use and you apply them in your own local context as you see fit right and so there's some links to some videos here if you're welcome to watch those but you know you want to think about how do we design systems? It's all about systemic change, all about systemic design. And so the idea behind permaculture is to be very intentional with your design, to be very thoughtful with your design, um, whether it's a house, a neighborhood, a garden, a backyard, an economy, um, it doesn't matter. So that's why I say it can be applied to pretty much anything. So we want to design systems that um, have high yield, that you don't need many external inputs. You want to be mostly self-sufficient. You want to be, uh, you know, in, in ecological balance. Um, so like the steady, you know, it integrates steady state economy into it. Um, and really, you know, this high yield is actually a, a really fundamental uh, principle in permaculture. So we should design systems so that you get a lot out of them. So, you know, looking at a food system, for example, a really well-designed permaculture garden or farm well, you don't need many inputs, so you don't need like fertilizer and biocides and pesticides and all that. Um, but it's designed to really be a productive garden. Like you're con like if you do it right, you're sort of harvesting things all year long, right? So really high yield, and that you can apply that to anything, you know, even uh, personal relationships, right? So if you're lo going into some kind of a partnership, whether it's a personal or a political or a financial partnership there should be some like sort of productive outcome, even if it's just like getting to know the community or solving some problems here and there. Okay. Um, and so just a real brief history of permaculture. That's not the point of this lecture, but just to give you a, a, a little bit of a sense. Um, the concept was started by Bill Mollison and then uh, eventually David Holmgren. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but basically they were um, Australian. Um, Holmgren was a uh, um, he was a professor, and then he but he was also a wildlife biologist. Um, spent a lot of time outside, sort of observing how nature is just you know all the things that we've talked about, right? So like there's no waste in nature. And he also noticed things like where um, one ecosystem up, uh, butts up against another ecosystem, like um, an ocean and a grassland. He noticed that at that edge. 
um, there's a lot of like a, a lot of biodiversity. Um, then some other things like that. So we basically just kind of um, got to understand how, how nature really works and thought that, hey, you know what? We should start designing our human settlements to mimic the way nature, um, you know, I don't want to say designs things, because nature doesn't really have a design per se, but the way nature organizes itself. So we want to mimic nature to the extent possible. And one of the good quotes from him is that the problems of the world are becoming increasingly complex, but the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. So kind of getting back to like the basics um, and these sort of basic principles, um, which help address these complex uh, local and global issues. And just to give you a sense of where he was, he was actually in Tasmania, which is a little island off on the southern coast of Australia. And if you see, you know, you can see that there's a lot of different natural environments that um, exist here um, close to each other. So you have the marine environment here, you have sort of like a low shrubland, you have forest land, you have, I mean, mountains and glaciers. So he, one of the, one of the driving forces behind the development of the permaculture idea is that he saw all these systems kind of working in harmony um, and that noticed, again, that as these systems sort of meet, that's where you get a lot of your um, novel solutions and biodiversity and so forth. So you want to jot down these three core ethical principles. Uh, this was in the video. Um, and they are care for the earth, care for people, and fair share. So care for the earth, pretty straightforward, right? We need to care for the earth, right? Um, uh, environmental concern is really important. Care for people, again, this is kind of the social side of sustainability, stuff that we've talked about a lot. Fair share, um, it really just means share the surplus. And so they mentioned that in the video. Now, this is, the idea here is that there's enough to go around. There's enough money to go around, there's enough food, there's enough water, there's enough resources. And we've talked about this before. And so one of the absolute fundamental aspects of permaculture is that if you have a surplus, to the extent possible, you should share it, whether that's your time, your energy, uh, your money, your food. Um, it's sort of this like trying to balancing everything out to the extent possible with the recognition that there there is enough to go around, enough resources to go around. The real problem is distribution of those resources. So those three principles are essential and they uh, sort of cut through all of all of uh, all aspects of permaculture. Um, so there was a short reading um, from a book called Gaia's Garden, um, and a few of the highlights of that reading um, are that, number one, permaculture uses principles and practices. It's, the, it's a set of tools. Um, so Gaia's Garden, this book, is focused primarily on designing um, landscapes and gardens and, to some extent, um, you know, like uh, home design and interior design. But one of the core things to understand is that permaculture has these tools that you can use and you can apply them in, in any context. Um, and that if we if we, we can design the most sustainable, you know, whatever backyard garden or farm or property that we want, but if it's embedded in a, a system that's unsustainable, it's not going to make enough of a difference. And so with permaculture, you kind of keep your... I locally, but think about the global impact and how to um, sort of expand what you're doing at a local level on a broader level. Um, and again, he just mentions that you can apply this to basically anything from energy to wastewater, villages, businesses, farms, and so forth. Um, really important to understand, and this is absolutely fundamental to this, um, to, to the idea of permaculture, that it focuses on connections. So it doesn't you're always keeping your eye on the sort of systemic level. So even when you're, you know, building, again, as an example, a backyard garden, using permaculture principles, you think about how that garden connects to the neighbor's yard, how it connects to the, the whole neighborhood, how it connects to the ecosystem that it's existing within. And so those connections are absolutely essential um, in, in permaculture. Again, it's, it's this design approach. Right? So it's not a one-size-fits-all, it's not a like, you have to do this, period. It's here's some ways that you can make you know, your systems more sustainable and you figure out how to apply them in your own local context. So it's very localized. Um, and as, as I mentioned, there are these design principles. Um, we don't have time to dig deeply into all of them, um, but I, you know, part of your assignment this week will be to 
to sort of investigate some of these. Um, but just so you know, you, you may see slightly different principles depending on whose uh, you know, book you read and so forth, but they're generally very similar. Um, and the idea behind the, the principles, again, is that this is kind of like your toolbox, if you will. And anytime you're trying to design a system, you can use these tools to more intentionally design it to be more sustainable, more holistic, uh, more regenerative, and so forth. Um, and so all of these, you know, we could spend hours talking about them, um, but they're all very important. Um, and I'll, I'll hit a couple of highlights here in a minute. Um, so there, there's a video here that, that's posted, and there's a link here in the um, PowerPoint. So I strongly suggest that you watch that. It's a really good demonstration of the, the 12 permaculture principles. So um, just a couple of examples of how you can integrate some of these principles into your life. I want you to sort of think about all of these um, and how they can be you know, how you can integrate them, how you can use them in different aspects of your life, like, you know, whether you're producing food or producing energy or your own personal relationships. Um, and you can see that if you really give it some thought that these do apply to a bunch of different, I guess, contexts, right? So like connect, for example, it's all about connections. And so if you're designing a backyard garden, you want to think about how it connects to the local environment and how the local environment connects to it, right? So is it in a wet area? Is it in a dry area? Is it in a sunny area? And so forth. But connections obviously uh, are relevant to things like personal relationships. So if you want to get, have good, robust personal relationships, you need to sort of develop connections and think about what, you know, the, the sort of connections between you and other people. If you're trying to get something done, like a big project even, I mean, it sounds silly, but connecting with with your you know uh, other folks that are trying to address the same problem that's an essential way to address it so that's just a couple of examples of how you can use um, one principle but all these other you know catch and store energy and materials this is a big one for me I, I integrate this a lot in my own life each element performing multiple functions so if you're going to make some kind of change you want to make the sort of least change for the greatest effect which is very similar to um, the, these two principles are very similar. Um, and I'll go over a couple of examples of this in a minute. Um, optimizing the edge is really important. That's kind of that whole, like, where the two ecosystems meet. That's where you end up with the most biodiversity. But if you think about, um, like, a professional, let's say a professional relationship, and let's, let's say you have a, a problem you're trying to address at work, and the best way to solve problems, creatively solve problems, is to have people with sort of different expertise um, and bring different things to the table. And so you can think of the edge as like where, where those, you know, where we all meet together to talk and like, let's say I'm an energy person and you're a policy person and you're a uh, health, you know, you're a health expert, you know, you know, uh, sociology or you're a social worker. So you're much more likely to have these really robust holistic solutions if you bring people with different backgrounds together and optimize that, that edge where they meet. Um, and, uh, I mean, turning problems into solutions this is another really big one that you could apply all over the place. Um, you know, even to the extent that the, you know, the pandem pandemic is a really good example of this, you know, it's one of those things where it was obviously an awful set of circumstances, but it's a problem that, you know, you couldn't avoid. And so, you know, one thing that you can do is, you know, I ended up working from home more. And so I actually... You know, one of the silver linings was I got to see my family a lot more, and I kind of got used to seeing my family more. And now, if I have to go back to work, um, it's going to be a little more difficult. But the point is that that was obviously a really big problem, um, and I wouldn't, you know, I certainly don't want anyone to go through that. But if you have a problem that's presented to you, take advantage of it and think of ways that you can use it to sort of, in the long run, you know, at least have some benefit. So, again, these are all just. You know, all these principles are just really, really practical, and you can apply them in uh, many different ways. Um, and so the sort of overall principles um, of permaculture, you know, a really big one is working with nature instead of against it. Okay, so again, this is something we've discussed before, but that's absolutely fundamental. We want to see what nature is providing and work with that instead of trying to always, you know, sort of um, you know, just do what we want and 
um, almost in opposition to nature. I think that you know this philosophy is really important. The problem is the solution. Um, in other words, you know problems are symptoms of something being out of balance. And again, you could apply this at any at any level. From you know a lot of folks uh, in the health you know the health field, for example, you know if you have maybe one ankle is sore, um, and the reason that's sore is because you were walking awkwardly because you twisted the other ankle or whatever. So basically the, the point is that a problem is just a sign that something's out of balance, and so you um, you have to look at that holistically and figure out the, the sort of the source of that issue, not just kind of put a band-aid on what's happening. Again, making the least change for the greatest possible effect, I, I use this, uh, this is something that I consider pretty much like all the time when I make decisions, like how can I maximize the benefit I get out of making a decision? Um, you know, one example is that, you know, I'm trying to ride my bike more, for example. And one of the reasons I do that is because there's so many different benefits to riding a bike. It gets me outside, it gets me fresh air, it gets me some exercise, I get to see my neighbors more, I'm cutting down on my emissions. I mean, there's just a bunch of benefits. So thinking very carefully and deliberately about you know, if you're making a change, how do you make that change that has the most positive impact? That's that's really fundamental. Um, and again, the you know this sort of uh, obtaining a yield is really important, and the idea that really if we design our systems properly, there's more than enough to go around. There's more than enough food. There's enough fresh water. There's enough money. There's enough everything. It's just the sort of the way it's distributed. So if we design our systems properly, we can obtain enough of a yield that everyone. Um, is is satisfied and again focusing on interconnections is absolutely essential and there's just you know a few examples of ways you can integrate some of these principles into your life like there's this idea idea of zones that's really big in permaculture and so they use this a lot in your um, gardening and so you know the things that you use most often you should have closest to the house your herbs and so forth and then things that you know you pick once in a while you would be further away from the house and the the things that you really pick rarely you make that the furthest away now even if you're not growing a garden you can use this principle in your own life like if you're redesigning your 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 kitchen your office your bedroom or whatever like those things that you use all the time you should have them close by so again this is just a lot of these principles are just really practical um and um you know with food again food is a really big focus of permaculture and so they focus on things like perennial crops and you know they don't put it use any artificial uh, pesticides or herbicides they use natural fertilizer very limited machinery and so forth so all these are really practical um, forest gardening if, again if you're into the farming and gardening part of things this is a really big part of permaculture and you sort of when you're gardening it's not an annual thing for permaculturalists so they think very long term and then how the different layers interact, like you have your tall trees on the sort of north side because you don't want your tall trees on the south because that'll block the sunlight and so forth. And there's there's certain um, plants that um, help other plants grow. And, um, you know, if you if you grow certain plants that have certain flowers that attract certain insects, which then kill the pests that kill other plants, it's something called integrated pest management. All these things, again, it's all holistic, it's all systems-based thinking, um, but a lot of there's a lot of applications for food. Um, community gardens are a really big one. Um, there's all these just numerous, numerous benefits of, uh, of gardening itself, but community garden in particular, um, there's health benefits, there's community development benefits, there's, there's property value benefits, there's all kinds of stuff. So again, it's one of those things that you make the least change for the greatest effect. Community garden is a really, really big one. As I said, bicycling is another one, but there's other things, composting, you know, buying used things, using local food systems, and so forth. I mean, these are just all really practical considerations. And if you're into this sort of thing, um, this is called an herb spiral. Um, this is a, a nice little permaculture application. Um, and this is, basically what happens is this is a three-dimensional, you can see it spirals up like this and it creates these little microclimates like the top is really sort of hot and dry you have this north side it gets a little wet and damp and then this this row actually it wraps around and it slopes downward and so the plants at the bottom the water drains down there and so the more water loving plants you put down there um, it's something that um, this is just a picture of uh, you know I built one of these one day at the University of Delaware with some friends and you know it's it's a nice little community building um, 
event as well. Chickens are big in permaculture, um, not just for meat, but eggs. They aerate the soil. They eat a lot of the um, bugs that kill crops. So again, it's one of those like, here's this one animal that serves all of these different purposes. You get eggs from it. You get like an egg, almost an egg a day. You get meat at the end. Um, they, you know, they, they kill all these bugs. They aerate the soil. Um, so it's, it's just something that it's one of those it has mul multiple purposes, um, which again is a big part of permaculture. Um, and then again, food forest. This is a, a you know a, a picture of a permaculture food forest. You can see there's sort of trees and there's the low-lying stuff and there's the little plants. So integrating all these different types um, into one space is really uh, an important part. Okay, so that's the the long and the short of permaculture. Huge, huge topic. Um, we are only scratching the surface. But if you are in, into this, I mean, there's permaculture farms all over the place. There's permaculture gardens. There's permaculture associations um, all over the place. So um, certainly something I'd be happy to point you in the direction of more resources if you're interested. And I want to briefly, we, we've gone over uh, regenerative agriculture before, but I just want to sort of reiterate some of the highlights here because it, it definitely fits um, into the theme. Um, and so remember, regenerative agriculture is this, it's a set of practices that increase biodiversity and soil health. Um, so there's all these great benefits. Um, increases the organic matter in soil, it reduces emissions, it actually store, uh, sequesters carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so it helps uh, fight clim climate change, um, reduces water use. I mean, there's just a bunch of different benefits to regenerative agriculture. Um, and it's kind of scary if you look at the numbers. Um, so at the current rate that we're losing soil, and this is legitimate, um, in about 50 years, if we continue to lose soil at the rate we're losing it. Okay, so we lose soil faster than it's replenished, um, which is one of the fundamental sustainability principles we've talked about. Um, if we continue to lose it at this rate, we will be effectively out of topsoil in about 50 years, which is really bad because that's where all the food grows. Um, in, in addition to that, um, agriculture is responsible for about 11% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and monoculture just doesn't do it. And even organic monoculture isn't going to replenish the soil like regenerative does. And so, you know, there's a bunch of different aspects to this. The main ones are uh, you don't till, so you don't dig up the soil as much, only to plant. Do you um, sort of, you know, you plant, you dig up just to plant the plant, not dig up the whole um, you know, soil bed. Um, you know, you, a lot of these will integrate animals into it, so rotational grazing, um, food forests are part of it. And um, this is a just, re, you know, regenerative, the key to regenerative agriculture is it's not just like we're not making things worse, but we're actually making things better. So that's, that's what, you know, if you think about the term regenerative or regenerating something. And what we're regenerating here is mostly soil and healthy um, biological communities. So we're actually, the idea is we can grow food and make things better. We're pulling more CO2 out of the atmosphere. We're building up the organic layer. We're reducing water use or maybe eliminating, you know, runoff, um, almost eliminating erosion. So we're making things better. Okay, so that's the idea behind regenerative agriculture. Okay, so um, we answered all these questions here. What is permaculture? It stands for remember it's permanent culture, and that's an important aspect of it because it's not just applied to agriculture; it's applied to culture in general. And you can apply it in many different ways, right? So you can apply it locally from your own house to your backyard to your neighborhood, your city, whatever. Um, remember, there's 12 principles, and a lot of them can be applied in many different ways um, in your own life. And they're really just a very practical way, um, and um, if you do it right, a sustainable way to uh, live. And then finally, we talked about um, regenerative agriculture. You know, it involves no-till farming, um, using organic uh, fertilizer, crop rotation, and so forth. And again, the idea here is to be regenerative, so actually make the soil better, make the environment better while we're growing our food. Okay, and that's it for this uh, lesson.